is starting. It has started right now. Okay. So we can begin and uh, we are halfway of our Levant session 2023 and I'm very happy to have with us dear friend and colleague, a renowned uh, archaeologist of the Levant. And I think that his, his name is pretty famous uh, for those who, who, who study and uh, investigate the, the, uh, the Levant, especially the Bronze and Iron Age uh, epochs. Uh, we have Hermann Gens, Professor Hermann Gens, I should say, um, with us, uh, who is giving uh, a talk about wood resources and timber procurement in the ancient Near East. Just a few words to introduce Hermann to, to the participants in this meeting, uh, although I think that these words shouldn't be necessary. Uh, but anyway, um, Hermann has received his PhD um, from the University of Tübingen in 1998, and since 2004, he is professor of, of archaeology at the American University of Beirut. He directed excavation projects in Lebanon at Tel Fadousk Farabida uh, 2004 and, uh, since 2004 until 2016, and since 2014 in collaboration with Ellison Demick of the Columbia University. Uh, he directed excavation also at Baalbek. Uh, since 2012, and these are ongoing excavations in collaboration with Margarete van Hesse of the German Archaeological Institute and Tel Mirhan since 2016, ongoing also uh, project in collaboration with Karen Kopetsky of the Austrian Academy of Sciences. His research focuses on the Bronze and Iron Ages of the Eastern Mediterranean, especially the Levant and Anatolia. His research interests include transition from village communities to more complex forms of socio-political organization, often called city-states, in the late 4th, early 3rd millennium, and the ultimate incorporation of the Levant into large empires in the 2nd millennium BCE, and the accompanying uh, socio-economic changes. Further fields are the chronological and functional aspects of Bronze Age pottery, the storage and trade of ag agricultural goods, mining and metallurgy, and trade relations between the Levant and the neighboring regions, as well as interrelations between human societies and their environment. So I think we have here real, one of the experts in, in a number of topics concerning the Levant, and actually the topic of this presentation is of the utmost importance, I think, for the, all, all those that are interested in the uh, study of uh, the uh, the Bronze Iron Age uh, of the region. So, I leave immediately the floor to our dear guest and colleague and friend. And thank you very much, Herman. The floor is yours. <laughs> thank you, Marco, for this introduction. Um, can you all hear me? Hello. I hear you very, very well. So I think ah, okay, okay, yeah. okay, good, okay, perfect. So uh, thank you very much for the introduction. So I'd uh, like to thank uh, Marco Yamoni and the Arva team for hosting me in the framework of this lecture series. Um, I should start, uh, however, with a disclaimer. Uh, as uh, Marco has already uh, said in the introduction, I'm neither um, an anthracologist, so I don't study charcoal. Uh, I'm also not an archaeobiologist. I'm just, let's say, an ordinary archaeologist. So I study, I approach this topic, the topic of this talk, uh, more from a cultural historical approach. And I will try to give an overview, um, trying to bring together different strands. Um, so, of course, I will try my best to incorporate uh, the results from archaeobiology, but bear in mind that uh, I'm an amateur in this field. Um, I should also um, maybe say a few words why I came to this topic. Um, as uh, Marco has said in the introduction, um, one of my current research projects are the excavations at Tel Mirhan, done in collaboration with uh, Dr. Karin Kopetsky from the, in the meantime, Austrian Archaeological Institute. Um, so a harbor city on the northern coast of Lebanon. And 
one of the research questions we developed there is the relation between this harbor city and its hinterland and mainly uh, the timber trade actually. So um, in this lecture, I will not really give any new results, but I use this as a starting point um, for actually um, just introducing this new research project. Um, results uh, from this uh, new project are not yet available, so um, I'll just um, uh, provide the background here, basically the history of research into this topic. Um, when it comes to um, the topic um, wood in archaeology, there is, of course, a vast literature approaching this topic from very, very um, different perspectives. Um, there, for instance, here I just present um, a very, very uh, brief selection of some of the um, more important works. Um, the first book, Trees and Timber in the Ancient Mediterranean World by Russell Meigs, is a classic. Um, he actually approaches this topic from um, the viewpoint of a classicist. Um, so his main sources are actually classical texts, Greek and Roman writers. He also incorporates uh, texts from the ancient Near East and Egypt. Um, um, deals also with iconography, but while uh, in uh, his first chapter actually he mentions the potential of, for instance, pollen analysis for future research at the time of um, uh, the writing of the book, hardly any pollen cores were visible, so he leaves that more as um, uh, a field for future research. Um, the second book, Timber in Ancient Israel by Neely Lifshitz, is one of the typical regional approaches in this book. She actually gives um, an, a very complete overview of the um, um, archaeology of wood um, in Israel in the, well, from the Neolithic to the Roman period. Um, I can only say what we urgently need in Lebanon is a book like this for uh, our country here. Um, the third volume I've selected is more um, uh, the, the um, Wood in Archaeology by Lee Newsom, um, is more actually a technical guide to wood archaeology, um, very recent, came only out last year. Um, so it deals with um, things like how is wood preserved, how should it uh, be um, taken out of the soil, how can it be analyzed, what can be done with it. So very, very interesting um, uh, topics for our talk here. Um, the only drawback of this book is that it hardly provides any examples from the ancient Near East. So it's a lot of New World archaeology, European archaeology, and so on. Um, but uh, the case studies he cites from the, the Near East, you can actually count on the fingers of one hand. Um, the last title shown here may come as a surprise, um, the um, uh, volume on uh, preliminary reports uh, from the old excavations at Kamit Elos. Um, I've just selected this because this volume contains the very first report on charcoal identification that I am aware of for Lebanon. So um, uh, the actual um, archaeological or bioarchaeological study um, uh, here in this region already started in the 1970s, basically. Um, but then we have a rather large gap, so it's only since the last 20 years that we have um, new results 
for this field from Lebanon. Um, as is quite well known, um, the topic of um, wood trade or timber trade especially um, uh, has been quite well treated by a wide variety of scholars. Um, as uh, I already said for the book of Russell Makes, um, many, um, uh, the traditional approach actually is through textual um, uh, studies. And there we have a wide variety of various texts ranging from Egyptian texts, um, the Old Testament, um, even lo some local texts are available. And of course, for uh, later periods, the, um, especially the Roman period, we have the classical writers um, who provide sometimes very, very interesting information. So here just um, uh, a random selection of important written sources for our topic, the Palermo stone, from uh, Old Kingdom Egypt actually records the first um, large-scale import of timber into Egypt, presumably from Lebanon or from the Le Levant. Um, there actually from under the reign of uh, Senefru, um, the um, arrival of 40 ships filled with ash wood. Um, ash uh, is a controversial a controversial uh, term in Egypt, but um, I think the pendulum swung, swung back now that the majority of scholars um, uh, agree on an identification with cedar wood. Um, we have uh, further Egyptian texts, the Jebel Barka stele uh, of Tutmosis III, for instance, found in Nubia, but um, describing the um, uh, one of the Near Eastern campaigns of Tutmosis, where um, he constructs ships in Mount Lebanon and transports these ships uh, towards the Euphrates for, um, let's say, um, a short um, military uh, intervention uh, on the borders of Mitanni. Um, the Van Amun report from um, the uh, third intermediate period in Egypt is, of course, a classic, uh, the, let's say, rather tragic story of this Egyptian priest who travels to Egypt to buy wood for one of the ritual barks uh, of Amun. And um, let's say the troubles he has actually uh, getting the wood from uh, the local king of Byblos. Um, what is also quite interesting is the little cuneiform tablet fragment found at Sidon quite recently. Um, it's one of the few cuneiform tablets um, that is actually attested from um, Lebanon. And interestingly, it contains a list of wooden objects. Um, this should remind us that um, Lebanon or to be more general, uh, the mountains of the Levant uh, are not only a source of timber as raw material, but that certainly also finished goods, finished wooden objects were um, exported and became um, a, val a, valid, uh, a valued commodity for trade. Um, on the uh, bottom right, we have again uh, an inscription from Lebanon, the Nebuchadnezzar, uh, the second inscription from Wadi Brisa in northern Lebanon, um, describing besides many, many of the uh, building activities of uh, this Babylonian king in Mesopotamia, also the procu procurement of cedars from Mount Lebanon. Um, while not strictly in the chronological framework of this uh, presentation, I actually will uh, restrict myself to the Bronze and Iron Ages um, and not really deal with the later periods because um, that's not my field of expertise. But definitely one source needs to be mentioned here. These are the famous forest inscriptions of the Roman Emperor Hadrian. 
Um, um, as you can see in the map, there is a dense concentration of these forest inscriptions uh, found in Mount Lebanon. Um, up to now, 200, um, more than 250 of these inscriptions have been recorded. Um, and to the best of my knowledge, this is actually the only case of such inscriptions in the entire Roman Empire. While it is well known that the Romans um, obtained timber from a variety of places, um, Italy, Gaul, uh, and so on and so forth, um, Lebanon is the only region where we have these forest inscriptions. And two examples are given on the right of this slide. Um, the uh, inscriptions are highly abbreviated. They give the name Emperor uh, of, of uh, Emperor Hadrian, um, mention the borders of the forest, and then there are some variations in the descriptions. But um, most, in most of the cases, it says um, four species um, of uh, trees are protected; the others are available for private use. The bad news is that no inscription, not a single inscription, specific, specifies the four trees, the four species of trees that are actually under imperial protection. But we can be fairly certain that it is uh, the most valued um, uh, trees for high quality timber, namely um, the cedar, of course, um, fir, pine, and then with the fourth um, uh, species, it gets already problematic. Some suggest oak, um, others uh, cypress or juniper. So um, without any further evidence, we can't really uh, be more specific here. These Inscriptions are generally regarded as an indication that already in Roman times um, there was massive deforestation so that the emperor needed to protect the valuable trees, um, especially for the maintenance of the Roman fleet. Um, of course, besides the texts, we also have iconographic evidence. Um, not a lot of um, iconographic examples, but two of the better knowns are presented here. Uh, one Egyptian from Karnak, from the reign of Seti, late Bronze Age, um, where actually an official, an Egyptian official, supervises um, the local population cutting down trees for the pharaoh. And the very interesting um, observation here is, if you look at the trees that are depicted here, they don't really look like real trees. Um, it's more basically, um, let's say, uh, very thin poles uh, with a few added leaves and so on. Um, this is, it's widely believed that the Egyptian artist who was actually commissioned to create this depiction never saw the trees in reality. He just um, saw the timber uh, stripped of all the branches arriving in um, Egypt and then had to use his imagination to create something that looked like trees. On the right side, we see the transport of timber by ship in the Iron Age. These are the famous um, uh, Khorsabad reliefs, reliefs from the Egyptian palace, uh, the, sorry, the Assyrian palace of Sargon II in Assyria. Um, here we see how actually presumably on the Mediterranean, um, various small ships are loaded with timber or um, uh, drag um, logs of timber uh, behind them. So this gives us an idea about um, the actual um, transport of uh, the timber. We will come back to this issue later on. Um, now, when it comes to the actual source or sources of this timber, um, 
this topic has been um, approached by uh, a number of scholars, mostly from uh, a purely biological aspect. Um, it is, uh, I think, well known that um, Lebanon has a rather um, diversified uh, flora. We have um, a number of vegetational zones here, ranging from uh, a typical Mediterranean vegetation in the coastal plain to uh, actually coniferous forests in the higher mountain ranges. Um, so uh, it's this kind of um, uh, subdivision of um, vegetation zones actually according to height above sea levels. The map in the top left uh, actually gives you an idea of the various zones and uh, the diagram at the bottom of this slide gives an idealized cross-section through Lebanon um, starting um, uh, on the left side with the coastal plain, then uh, going up to Mount Lebanon, um, the Bikar Valley, and then the anti-Lebanon, again, where we have um, different types of trees. Um, the um, lower um, uh, foothills are mainly um, dominated by oak. Then pine comes in, cedar starts mm, yani, around uh, 1,500 meters above sea level, and the highest mountain ranges are covered by juniper. Um, however, this is a very much idealized reconstruction. Um, the map on the uh, top uh, right uh, shows actually in black the remaining spots of forest um, in contemporary Lebanon, that actually is already, um, well, uh, the, 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 this study was published in 1969. Um, we can be quite sure that um, in the meantime, probably um, more uh, losses of the Lebanese forest uh, have to be taken into account. The um, Arboreal vegetation of um, Lebanon, or let's say the coastal, uh, the, 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 uh, the Levant in general, of course, is very much determined by the amount of precipitation we have. Um, I don't want to go into details here, but the map on the left shows actually that um, especially Lebanon and um, there, especially the western facing slopes of Mount Lebanon, um, receive um, an extremely high amount of precipitation, actually rivaling, uh, uh, rivaling most of Central Europe, for instance. The only drawback here in Lebanon is that um, the precipitation is not evenly spaced throughout the year, but uh, almost exclusively falls in winter between let's say, November and April, for instance. Nevertheless, um, uh, let's say um, the amount of precipitation is large enough, definitely, to uh, sustain um, copious forests in the mountains. Um, one of the questions we have to ask, of course, is can current weather dates um, be transferred back into the past, the Bronze and the Iron Ages, um, um, let's say not uh, automatically, but luckily we do have um, a few um, uh, indications of the past climate of this region. Um, here, just uh, as an example, uh, I show the analysis of one of the stalactites mites or stalactites, I never know which one is which, from the Jeta Grotto in Lebanon, um, which with the help of various isotope analyses gives um, uh, relatively good indications about the amount of precipitations in the past. And we do um, see that there are some um, variations, some ups and downs, especially in the um, earlier Holocene period, um, but also at later stages, there are, um, let's say, um, wetter and drier periods um, uh, are found uh, successively. 
Um, one um, a source of information that has uh, not really been taken into account so far by um, most of the uh, historians or archaeologists who dealt with um, uh, the timber trade of um, uh, Lebanon, for instance, are pollen analyses. Um, I already mentioned in the introduction, um, Russell Meigs uh, in his book was aware of the potential of pollen analyses, but um, at the time of writing, hardly any samples had been taken. So um, he couldn't really make use of that. Uh, in the meantime, we have um, not enough, but a good number of um, uh, pollen cores uh, from Lebanon. The majority, unfortunately, from the Bika. Um, we have already heard that for the forests uh, of Lebanon, especially the western slopes of Mount Lebanon, are of prime interest. Um, so. Um, there are still um, things to be done in this respect. Um, I don't want to uh, go into details about these, uh, the results of these pollen cores. Um, here are just four examples. Um, the main um, point uh, I want to focus on here is the general um, percentage of arboreal pollen versus non-arboreal pollens in the first diagrams uh, A, B, and C. The arboreal pollen are uh, shown in green, the non-arboreal pollen um, in blue. And you can see um, there, is, there are high variations. Um, and usually, when the number of arboreal, arboreal pollen are high, um, the percentage of non-arboreal pollen declines and vice versa. So um, one of the interesting uh, points uh, of the first diagrams, A, B, and C, is they all come from the Bika. Um, so within one geographical zone in Lebanon, and yet um, there are um, interesting variations. Uh, the Amik pollen core, for instance, <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> has um, um, a rather high percentage of uh, arboreal pollen in the late Holocene, um, whereas the two other, um, uh, uh, Khamsin and uh, Aljurt, um, show rather a decline in arboreal pollen at this point in time. Um, there are a number of problems, um, uh, let's say, with the interpretations here. Uh, I'll come back to this. Um, the fourth diagram uh, from uh, the Lake of Yamune um, actually takes a much wider uh, chronological approach, whereas the, uh, the first three ones basically focus on the Holocene, the periods after the end of the Ice Age. Um, the Yamune core actually uh, covers the entire Pleistocene as well, so takes us back into much uh, older times, um, which I think for the long-term development of forests in um, uh, Lebanon is quite interesting. Um, so as we have seen, while we have a number of pollen cores, we definitely don't have enough. and. Um, especially um, the western slopes of uh, Mount Lebanon um, so far have not really been analyzed. And that's where actually um, our new project comes in, the Mirhan project, with the question, how was the um, uh, how were the relations between the port of Tel Mirhan with uh, its hinterland and Clearly, um, uh, as I've shown so far, um, timber is one of the main exports of Lebanon during the Bronze and Iron Ages. So the question of timber trade is of great significance here. 
And um, so therefore, uh, Karin Kopetsky and I, together with a number of collaborators from the University of uh, Eichstätt Ingolstadt in Germany, um, the uh, University of Life Sciences in Vienna and various other collaborators um, have embarked on a project to um, take pollen cores as a kind of profile ranging from the coast to the higher mountain ranges. Um, the location of these, uh, where we took these pollen cores, are indicated on the map uh, to the left. Um, unfortunately, our um, choice of sites for taking pollen cores was somewhat limited. Uh, of course, the first uh, problem was to locate sites where um, pollen have potentially been preserved. And the second problem was we were working with uh, the local company Etrafor with um, a tubular drill mounted on a truck. And the sites uh, we chose for drilling had, of course, to be accessible with that truck. So nevertheless, we have uh, a grand total of 11 new pollen cores right now, ranging from the coastal plain to the um, almost uh, peaks of uh, Mount Lebanon. Um, however, this is work in progress. We took the cores uh, in uh, the summer of 2022, um, but the analysis is only about to start as we speak. So we don't have any results so far. So if I am uh, allowed to give the same lecture in, let's say, two or three years, probably I will have to say more about that. Um, while pollen definitely are a valuable source for reconstructing the forest history of a region, there are, of course, a number of problems, as always. Um, the first problem is um, the exact dating. As archaeologists, of course, we want to relate uh, these um, vegetation uh, phases that we can reconstruct from the pollen to actual archaeological periods. And um, unfortunately, in a number of pollen cores, there are um, problems that radiocarbon dates are either not enough, um, they sometimes have uh, uncomfortably wide ranges, um, there is the so-called hard water effect that, uh, in fact, changes uh, the radiocarbon dates, makes them older. So this has to be taken into account and so on. So I don't want to bore you with um, details here. I just want um, to make clear that um, it's not uh, very easy to, let's say, transfer the data from these pollen cores into, let's say, uh, direct historical information. Uh, the other problem, of course, is a biological one. Um, we have uh, different types of uh, trees. For instance, we have um, insect pollinated trees versus wind pollinated trees and so on. Um, wind pollinating trees produce much more uh, pollen. So the likelihood that um, these pollen are overrepresented in the samples is quite large. Mm. And lastly, there is, of course, the problem when we encounter changes in the vegetation, for instance, a decline in tree pollen and um, a raise in non-arboreal pollen and so on. What do we make out of that? Um, are these climatic fluctuations or can we um, uh, suspect anthropogenic causes, deforestation, for instance, and um, uh, such things? So again, we have to be very, very careful here not to oversimplify um, the results that we get. Um, 
A second source for reconstructing uh, the arboreal vegetation of Lebanon, of course, is the um, study of anthropology, uh, basically the study of carbonized wood remains. Um, and as we uh, already saw in the introduction, um, the first uh, case where uh, carbonized wood was studied um, it comes from Kamit Eloz already in the 1970s. Um, all other sites that uh, are depicted on this map, um, let's say, basically represent work in progress. So um, these data literally only became available in the last, let's say, 10, 15 years. So that's why, um, for instance, uh, Russell Bakes in his classic book um, hardly could um, or did not really, um, at least for this region, use um, the actual botanical identification of wood remains from archaeological sites. Mm. So, um, interestingly, here we have um, a rather um, reversed picture of what we saw for the pollen cores. The pollen cores all concentrated in the Bika. Uh, here, the Bika is only represented by Kamit Eloz and Baalbek, whereas um, the majority of the sites uh, with uh, analyzed charcoal remains actually come from the coast. Um, I'm going to show you a few diagrams right now, um, just from a few sites. Uh, again, I don't want to go through this site by site. I just want to point out a few um, observations here. Um, so for early Bronze Age Fadausk Farabida, for instance, on the coast, um, what is interesting is that um, the olive wood is absolutely dominant, and this probably reflects um, the wide-scale cultivation of this tree for actually not its wood, but uh, the fruits, the olives uh, in the region. Let's say um, all other um, species are, let's say, um, represented uh, at a much, much lower percentage. Um, pistachio, uh, pistachio um, uh, juniper, uh, oak, and so on are, let's say, reasonably well um, represented. Um, interesting is this uh, cedar peak here. That clearly does not um, uh, represent a tree naturally present in the coastal plain of Lebanon. That is clearly an import from the higher mountain ranges. So um, interestingly, cedar was not only an export commodity uh, of Lebanon, but was all also locally used. Um, here, just as an example, um, um, rather beautifully preserved collapsed roof uh, from the site of Farawisk Farabida. Uh, Tel Arka, farther to the north, uh, also has provided extremely interesting um, results for the early Bronze Age 4. Um, the early Bronze Age 4a settlement uh, around 2200 BC ends in a great conflagration. And um, this conflagration led to the fact that a lot of the structural timbers are quite well preserved, as shown uh, in the plan on the left. And that enabled the late uh, Jean-Paul Talman actually to reconstruct um, the, the roof constructions and so on, as can be shown in the right. So we have um, uh, upright posts, um, uh, vertical logs uh, forming uh, the various, uh, let's say, ceilings and so on and so forth. Um, interesting is, again, here the fact that the majority of the wood used for um, the construction for construction purposes here is again cedar. Um, the uh, there is no exact um, uh, quantified analysis available for this, 
um, the uh, specialist uh, just says 95% of the wood have been identified as cedar and um, that's basically it. So cedar, again, um, highly prized wood for construction. Um, Sidon, uh, again, has no um, uh, quantified data, but a number of um, various species are represented, um, uh, pine, olive, cedar, and so on and so forth. So, um, um, yeah, uh, same with Tel El Burak. Um, where we have, uh, interestingly, both Middle Bronze Age and Iron Age remains. And from this table, you can actually glimpse that there are, interestingly, a number of differences between the two periods, that some species are represented only in the Middle Bronze uh, Age, others only in the Iron Age. Um, uh, percentages also vary greatly, but um, one, um, let's say, very, very highly uh, uh, present uh, species is again the olive, uh, showing that both during both the Middle Bronze Age and the Iron Age, the coastal plain was definitely um, dominated by olive plantations. Um, from the Bika, um, uh, I will only uh, uh, show uh, Baalbek here. Um, uh, we have uh, so far only a very, very limited area uh, under the Roman temple in the courtyard, um, directly going into the Middle Bronze Age there, where um, the photo at the bottom again shows you we're very likely again dealing with a collapsed roof because we have large parts of uh, burnt timber beams. And the analyses um, basically shows only two species, oak um, and cedar. Okay, um, without going into further details here, um, we again have to state that there are, are unfortunately a number of problems with these data. First of all, the charcoal found in settlements definitely does not reflect one-to-one um, -one, um, the ancient forests in the region um, because the timber brought into the settlements um, were um, uh, se deliberately selected by humans. Um, uh, and again, we have to um, suspect, according to uh, data from other regions, that differences were also made. Um, in the case of fuel, so wood for, for cooking, heating, and so on, uh, probably the collection principle of the least effort was um, applied. So basically, people collected everything that was available. On the other hand, for constructional purposes, um, a more careful selection of species was made. Um, here, it's especially quality and size, the straightness of the timbers and so on that matter. And therefore, uh, a number of species that are abundant in the region, like olive or oak, for instance, are underrepresented uh, in the uh, structural timbers uh, for uh, construction purposes. Coniferous wood was definitely more uh, chosen, more often chosen, was preferred. Um, and that actually, in many cases, means importing this timber from greater distances. Um, keeping in mind that we're speaking about Lebanon. There are no real great distances here in Lebanon, but let's say 20, 30, 40 kilometers, um, that is something uh, we have to take into account when we have cedar wood, for instance, uh, attested on the coast. Um, now, one of the big problems, of course, is while through wood identification, and so on, we can definitely prove the um, 
trade and transport of timber. So as I already said, if we find um, coniferous wood like uh, cedar, pine or um, whatever on the coast, we can be quite sure these trees didn't grow here, but grew inland in the mountains. But how was the timber actually transported from the place of growth um, to the places where it was used for construction or shipped to Egypt or wherever? Um, as I already said in the introduction, we have a few texts which unfortunately are surprisingly, um, let's say, uh, scarce with information. Um, so the Jebel Barkal Stele, for instance, of uh, Tutmosis III said, uh, says only uh, that, that, that I had many sh let many sh ships be constructed of cedar that, that, uh, and they were put on carts pulled by oxen. Huh. Uh, that doesn't really tell us much about the actual procurement. The oxen mentioned here are probably used for the transport of the already built ships towards the uh, Euphrates. A little bit more specific is the report of Ven Amun um, a few centuries later, where um, finally, after having received payment, uh, the Biblian prince sent 300 men and 300 oxen into the mountains. Um, uh, timber were, uh, timbers were cut, and these uh, timbers have to actually season for a while. They have to dry out before they can actually be used for uh, further construction and so on. So interestingly here, um, the 300 oxen suggest a transport of the timber actually over land, that the oxen were used to drag um, the logs uh, down from the mountains to the sea, to Byblos actually. Uh, the Wadi Brisa in, uh, inscription uh, tells us again uh, the, let's say that, that Nebuchadnezzar um, uh, cut actually apparently passages through the mountain. I crushed the stones of the mountains. I opened passes into the mountains. I prepared a passage for the transport of the cedars and so on. Um, then he says, I bundled them like reeds and perfumed the river Arachtu with them. That could suggest that um, uh, rivers or water logging was actually used for the transport, but we have to be a little bit careful here because the Arachtu uh, very likely refers to the Euphrates. So it's the transport, um, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> <coughs> it's the last part of the transport of the timber towards um, Babylon, so not the actual, um, let's say, procurement of the timber in the mountains of Lebanon that we are dealing with here. Um, so, um, basically, we have, according to, uh, icon uh, to, to um, ethnographic uh, sources from let's say the 19th, early 20th century worldwide, we have two options, either land transport via oxen or horses are sometimes used or water transport, just floating the logs. Interestingly, um, very, very few scholars have considered this problem, this how were the logs transported from the mountains to uh, the C, for instance. One of the few exceptions is Lucy Sema'an in her 2015 article, um, where she really gives um, valuable insights into the possible transport of um, timber from the mountains to Byblos. She actually um, considers three wadi systems in the vicinity of Byblos and uh, in, in, in detail looks at them, uh, whether they are uh, suitable for uh, water transport or not. And she says that the Wadi or the Nar el-Fidar 
possibly can be used for water transport and a uh, little farther to the south, the Nar Ibrahim, uh, very likely. Um, other uh, wadi systems she looked at are either too short or too um, curved and so on. There are so obviously a number of problems. Um, in our um, project, of course, um, we are faced with the same problems. Um, the, a little farther north, so um, the harbor uh, of Tel Mirhan right here, um, the origin of the trees um, in the mountain ranges. We have the Wadi Asfur, which possibly can be used for logging, but um, as we did in 2018, a very detailed LIDAR scan of the entire landscape here, we have an extremely detailed terrain model. And there, our colleagues from the Catholic University of Ingolstadt Eichstätt um, use this terrain model, for instance, to uh, conduct least cost path analyses. And so what we see here, for the time being in a theoretical model, is a combination of waterborne transport and land transport. Um, this model will um, keep to be uh, will uh, keeps to be further developed. Um, one of the next steps is that, um, as we know that, um, let's say the availability of water changed uh, to a certain extent um, during the last five six thousand years. So the late Holocene, basically, um, let's say our colleagues will create models to see how higher water tables in the river systems um, may facilitate the water transport of logs. Um, when it comes to the actual um, act of cutting the trees on the mountains, there is actually not much we can say. We have no local depictions of um, tree cutting scenes. Uh, the ones we have are uh, all from Egypt. Here are just a few examples. We saw um, one, a uh, further one uh, from the time of Seti the uh, first at the beginning of this presentation. Um, so basically, as Russell Meigs already said, um, let's say from prehistory to the early 20th century, um, the method of cutting trees did not change at all. Um, basically, the use of axes is attested um, here in various Old and Middle Kingdom um, uh, scenes um, and so on. Um, so uh, the other um, implement that plays uh, an important role that we saw in this uh, relief from the time of Seti and also mentioned uh, in the uh, when Amun inscriptions are ropes, probably for, um, let's say, dragging the trees um, uh, for transport purposes and so on. So we can be quite sure that um, the branches, the, 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 the trunks were stripped of their branches, uh, branches already at the place where the, 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 the trees were cut because uh, transporting a tree with all the branches is rather difficult. So it was actually only the logs that were transported. Um, uh, the tools, uh, as I said, uh, are largely axes. Um, here on the left, we actually um, see um, a chance find of an Egyptian old kingdom axe from the Nar Ibrahim, so from one of the river mouths, um, one of the rivers that actually Lucy Sema'an um, identified as one of the possible transport routes of the timber uh, from the mountains to the sea. Um, so this um, uh, Egyptian axe that actually has an inscription, mentions a ship crew, um, and so on, has often been used as evidence for showing um, Egyptian wood cutting activities here. Um, 
I would be very, very careful with this assumption um, because um, basically axes like any other woodworking tools are essential for a ship. Um, there are constant repairs to be made um, and so on. So for instance, here in the middle, um, of this slide, we have uh, a selection of woodworking tools from the Uluburun shipwreck from the southern coast of Turkey. This is basically just um, the carpenters, the, the ship, ship's carpenter's toolbox. Uh, it doesn't mean that the Uluburun ship, for instance, was um, engaged in, uh, let's say, uh, timber trade or whatsoever. So uh, therefore, I think uh, an isolated find like one Egyptian axe uh, cannot really uh, be used to substantiate, uh, let's say, massive Egyptian woodcutting activities already in the uh, old kingdom here. Um, probably when the wood was, uh, let's say, the wood was probably rather cut by the locals, and then uh, only taken over by the Egyptians once it was brought uh, to the coast. And um, so the last image just shows a random uh, Middle Bronze Age uh, axe from Tel Arka. Uh, basically, axes are, um, let's say, uh, tools that are found everywhere. So um, we should be very, very careful not to, um, let's say, um, uh, exaggerate uh, the importance of these axes. We have, uh, let's say, uh, bronze or iron axes uh, also in regions where definitely no timber uh, cutting activities were ever uh, conducted, like uh, the, the early Bronze Age city of Arad in southern Israel, for instance. So um, axes, be they out of copper, bronze, or iron, or whatsoever, were just part of the uh, tools used um, in everyday life. So they do not uh, automatically uh, point to timber cutting activities. Um, so um, just to sum up, because I realize I've already been speaking for almost an hour, um, there is definitely a lot that still needs to be done. Um, we have, we need more pollen cores, we need more charcoal analyses and so on. Um, we need to carefully compare um, the results of the individual sites with each other for the time being. Um, hardly any comparative um, studies between different sites have been made. Um, we hope that in the future we can um, uh, actually come up with better results there. Um, just one observation that I found very interesting was the use of um, cedar wood in ordinary domestic structures in early Bronze Age Tel Arka and Middle Bronze Age um, uh, Baalbek, for instance. In both cases, the architecture suggests no special buildings. The structures where the cedar wood was found are clearly ordinary domestic structures. Um, however, if we look at the um, uh, countries surrounding Lebanon, the moment cedar wood is attested, it is mainly restricted to important buildings. The late Bronze Age palace in Katna, for instance, um, Bronze Age temples in Lachish in Israel and so on and so forth. So <coughs> excuse me. Uh, in that case, um, the high quality um, cedar wood was clearly, let's say, that expensive that it could only be used for construction in important buildings, whereas nearer to the source in Baalbek and Arka, where basically you just have to drag the cedars down the mountains, um, the use of cedar is much more widespread. Um, so, um, but again, uh, we need to see if the 
let's say uh, for the time being, there are just two sites um, that show the use of cedar for ordinary domestic uh, construction. Um, we have to see whether this is a pattern that we see in other Lebanese sites as well. Um, so what actually remains is just to um, give some acknowledgements. Um, of course, uh, the work I do here in Lebanon could not have been done without the support of the Direction Générale des Antiquités. Um, the various uh, excavation teams from the sites uh, I worked on or, or I directed, uh, Tel Farawisk Farabida, Baalbek and Tel Mirhan, um, of course, shaped a lot of the ideas I presented here. Um, we discussed uh, a number of these things, especially um, now with the, with the current Tel Mirhan project, where, as I said, uh, the question of timber trade is one of the um, main um, issues of the project. So, um, and uh, a number of, um, uh, let's say, um, issues were also uh, discussed with my wonderful colleagues at the Department of History and Archaeology at the American uh, University here, uh, Helen Sader, Paul Newson, Claire Mallison, and so on. So, um, I think I've used up my time. So thank you for listening. And um, I'm willing to answer questions. Thank you very much, uh, Herman, for this, this uh, fascinating presentation about the, the, the trade of wood. And, and, uh, and I, I loved it, I liked it very much. So I see that there are a number of, of uh, I think, colleagues and students, so I, I invite them to, to mm -hmm. ask, uh, to exploit the chance and uh, ask you questions, uh, either directly to you or uh, on, uh, uh, on the chat. I think we have already uh, Joan Scarlock, yeah. uh, yes, uh, the, the microphone is muted. Okay, there we go. Yes. Uh, okay. I wanted to, uh, you were talking about the taking of timber in the Anthropocene. Um, there's yes. a very nice, from the Wadi Brissa actually, a full inscription, gives some very information on, uh, interesting information on that subject. Um, Nebuchadnezzar essentially, uh, they had campaign after campaign after campaign into the Lebanon. They didn't just mm -hmm. go, they came back again and again and again uh, to cut more timber. And they had so yes. much they used it to make bridges. They even lined it up as kind of a trophy along the streets. The theory was that the, the forest belonged to Marduk and it should uh. never have been used for uh. any other palace than his own or than the Babylonian king or temple than for Marduk and his friends. Okay. Okay. So, deliberate clear cutting. And uh -huh. you have on the opposite side, there's a, there's a scene that shows him the killing the lion, you know, the sort of standard. Yes. Opposite, yes. On the opposite side, there is a mirror image of that on the other side of the wadi. <laughs> and that shows him, it's very effaced, it's been hacked to pieces, but you can still make it out that he is murdering a tree. Yeah. Uh <laughs> Um, okay, yes, uh, so I, uh, for, for Wadi Brissa, I actually um, relied very much on the recent um, uh, articles uh, of uh, Da Silva, uh, Rocchio uh, Da Silva, who... No, Da Riva, Da Riva, yeah. Okay, yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, who um, translated uh, the texts again, and um, so with the, with the tree, um, apparently there are different interpretations. Some say, oh, it's a, he's cutting down a tree, or as you said, he's murdering. Um, da Silva actually says he seems to be worshipping a tree. So oh, um, yeah. the, 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 <laughs> the, 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 the image is apparently rather eroded, so we probably cannot be sure about this. Yeah, well, what I see is when you put it against the other image, which shows the, mm -hmm. the king stabbing the lion in the stomach, He's Makes got a knife in his hand and he's stabbing the tree in the stomach. Okay. Exactly the same spot. Yeah. You do not stab trees in the Can stomach. Can very well be. And at the root. Okay. <laughs> Where he's even hitting on the tree is obvious he's not cutting it yeah. down. Yeah. Okay. Anyway, I'll shut up. 
Okay, thank okay. you. So before moving to other questions, I just forgot that I had to stop the recording of the of the lecture. Oh. In any case, the, the the question and answer will be cut out of the of the video that we ah, okay. that will be uploaded um, on the YouTube channel.